Hi, I'm Gail Rubin. Welcome to today's episode of A Good Goodbye Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die. Welcome to today's show, brought to you by the fine folks at French Funerals and Cremations. As the doyen of death, check out the pearls, I'm all about getting the funeral planning conversation started. A doyen is a woman who's considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject. And that would be me when it comes to the party no one wants to plan, a funeral or memorial service. By thinking about what you'd want in your funeral and having that conversation before there's a death or illness, you can reduce stress at a time of grief, minimize family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. That's what this program is all about. Just as talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead, and your family will benefit from the conversation. So let's get that conversation started. Our guest today to discuss end-of-life issues is Mindy Horwich, a licensed independent social worker who specializes in helping people talk about advanced directives and hospice care. Welcome, Mindy. Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk a little bit about advanced directives. Are they for old people? Advanced directives are actually a process for people to go through, and I like to use the word advanced care planning more mm -hmm. than just directives. Uh, there's many facets to advanced care planning. One is the actual paperwork that is a legal document that you fill out naming your surrogates or decision makers. But more importantly is what goes into the document, and that's all the conversations you want to have with your family and your loved ones that you who will be making these decisions on your behalf if if you need that kind of help when you get to the end of life which could be at any age which could be at any age right so primarily older people start thinking about this when we're younger we think we're immortal and we don't need to think about this well and i <laughs> i think they are i have found them to be extremely beneficial for any age uh, it's harder to think about when you're younger because mm -hmm. you just want to plan for the things that are very life affirming. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to plan for the things that you know are going to end the life, no matter at what age, whether you're in your 40s or your 90s. Mm -hmm. But all, the conversations are incredibly important throughout the lifespan. The example that everybody gives is Terry Schiavo as somebody who just suddenly had an event that put her in a state where she could not communicate her wishes and yeah. on life support basically right and so an advanced directive helps you to avoid being in that kind of situation so it's a very important set of documents to actually get done up yes and the what I'd like to stress to people is the advanced directive is necessary from a legal standpoint when you get into the medical system they're going to look for the legal document but the more important aspect to it is being able to have the knowledge of what that person would have wanted. Mm -hmm. Because in the, in the intensity of the moment of making those decisions, especially if the person is young like Terry Shiva was, mm -hmm. sometimes it's hard for you to remember what was said if it wasn't written down mm -hmm. and you also end up in all of the emotional turmoil and conflict that happens when you are having to make a decision about basically choosing to stop the medical intervention of keeping the body alive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and allowing nature to take its course. That's a lot harder. And aren't there some really good uh, pieces of information um, to help you communicate to people what level of medical intervention you would want 
like five wishes or other documents like that? Yeah, there's five, I like the five wishes format. It gives you a lot of aspects to not just what you would want in terms of medical intervention, but it also talks about what is what matters to you in your quality of life. Mm -hmm. What music mm -hmm. do you like? Who do you mm -hmm. want there? How do you want to be cared for? Where would you like to be? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's one good format. There's also a wonderful new format that is now available online called the Conversation Project. I've heard of that. Yeah. It's free, mm -hmm. and you, it, it is really helping you begin to have the talks with the, your family and friends to let them hear what your wishes are, how you feel about the fact that you're reaching the end of life or how you may feel mm -hmm. when it gets to your end of life so that it becomes a process, a conversation that happens over time rather than just in the heat of the crisis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, when you do have a terminal illness and you're given six months to live, uh, you are eligible for hospice care. Mm -hmm. What is hospice care? Help, help us understand that. So there are actually two stages to end of life medical care. One is called palliative care and it's less known, it's a, it's a growing aspect, specialty of medical care. And what that does is really help people that are looking at probably the end two years of their life. And it works on helping them deal with comfort measures. So looking at, they may still be going through some aggressive treatment, but they really understand that the aggressive treatment, they know it has an end in a limited time. And what they really want to work on is symptom management along with aggressive care. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That would probably be a first step for many people. For mm -hmm. example, if you get a Parkinson's diagnosis, you may actually be eligible for palliative care years before you would become eligible for hospice. Mm -hmm. When you get to the end stage of the disease, uh, and there are very specific criteria under Medicare and medical guidelines for hospice, uh, you become eligible for hospice program and what that is is really the support given to do the end of life final six months to a few days care. Mm -hmm. uh, you are not going to get any aggressive treatment anymore. You are going to avoid the ER unless there are special circumstances and all of the care is done where you live or if you are admitted to an inpatient hospice, it can be done in a hospice setting, but you really kind of circumvent the medical system other than the hospice care you're receiving. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, our own family had experience with palliative care uh, with my father-in-law, mm -hmm. and even with advanced directives, you know, a letter of this is what I want, you still have family members who may say, do everything. Right. And what do you do in that kind of situation? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you're put in a tough spot. It, 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 again, it, because our culture, and I so appreciate that you're having this show and you've written your book, and it's, I believe that now the time is really ripe for this topic to really become much more public and normalized. Mm -hmm. The important thing is that everybody really understand that death is not optional. Yeah. <laughs> that we all will die, it's a 100% mortality rate, and no matter what the medical system or ads on TV or your doctors have you believe, there really does come an end to what we can do to preserve life and even improve it. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we can actually do more harm with medical intervention than trying to use our medical technology to help somebody. Mm -hmm. And when Generally, the, the family members or the people that have the hardest time at that moment could very well be the ones that haven't been watching the process of the person who's in that position. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. all you can do is give them a little time mm -hmm. to really absorb how that person is and what they're going through medically mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. physically and maybe spiritually mm -hmm. in order for that person to come to a different understanding of this is really time to stop medical intervention and allow nature to, to take its course. Yeah. Now, with palliative versus hospice, I know hospice has a whole team of folks to help support the family. Mm -hmm. Does that apply to palliative care as well? It, to a lesser degree. Hospice will basically take over all care. You get equipment that would not necessarily be provided in other areas of medical care. Uh, you have nurses that are trained in, in symptom management for pain and anxiety and 
dying mm -hmm. symptoms. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a chaplain, uh, social worker, um, and other services that come in the home for personal care that generally aren't covered by insurance um, in mm -hmm. other parts of your medical care when you are looking at healing. Mm -hmm. um, palliative will usually have a social worker involved. Uh, so it's usually a doctor or a medical professional and a social worker and all of the other support services you would gather from your own community, such as spiritual support and physical care. Okay. Well, we're going to take a short break here, and when we return, we will speak further with licensed independent social worker Mindy Horwich on end-of-life issues. How can you eat like that? Relax, dude. I'm freaking dead. It's one of the perks. I can eat whatever the hell I want. How do I get in on this? What, the whole death thing? Yeah. First off, I mean, look at what you're eating. No wonder you've lived this long. Feed this to the village cow, all right? Bring him a glass of your finest expired milk. Oh, before you go checking out, do you have a will? Any funeral arrangements, plans like that? Did you? No, and because of that, now my family's in turmoil. They're fighting, bickering over money. Now they're dead broke. Do some real planning, okay? Before you figure out your exit strategy. See, everybody's doing it. I can't wait to get started. I've never seen anybody dying to die like you. Good luck, kid. Welcome back. We're speaking with Mindy Horwich, a licensed independent social worker. And let's continue our conversation about end of life issues. So Mindy, there are studies that show that 70% of the population says they would like to die at home, and yet we have 70% of people dying in hospitals or nursing homes. Mm -hmm. How can we help people actually get the kind of death that they say they want? I believe that's going to take a number of steps. Uh, one will be a shift in, I believe, how our medical care providers are trained. Many of them are, have no training in how to look at end-of-life issues, how to really step back and say, in the big picture of this person's care, where are they in their process of life or process of their disease? Uh, I believe some of it will come from a different clinical standard of what is considered good care when we know we cannot cure anymore. Mm. And I think the most powerful change agent is going to be the patients themselves, us individuals being able to say to ourselves and, and admit and come to some acceptance within ourselves mm -hmm. that we have a mortality, we don't know the when or the how, we, we do know we will die, and how do we as people want to integrate that into our existence mm -hmm. as human beings, uh, even though we have a medical system that can support unbelievable advancements and, and life prolonging technologies. One question we don't ask enough of ourselves in the system is what quality of life do I want? Exactly, quantity versus quality. Right, yeah. right. We all, we, we like quantity. <laughs> um, I don't think, and, and I think part of the reason for that statistic, in my personal experience, is there, it's a very gray area to pinpoint. It's very hard to know that this is really the one time they're not going to get better. So the, the human body is a remarkable um, tool. It's a remarkable organism, organism <laughs> that wants to be alive. And so it can recover to a certain point. And it is very hard to say this is the one time they're not going to. Mm -hmm. So many times people die in the hospital because they go back in because they had a stroke before, they got better. So they'll just go back in because maybe this time will be the same, and yet this time it's not. Mm -hmm. And part mm -hmm. of that is their own belief. When we face our mortality, I think it, fear of dying is a natural symptom of dying. Mm -hmm. And so we have a hard time facing those fears. And so we do end up and being in a hospital because we feel maybe there's something we can do. And something may happen that creates a, a more sudden episode rather than having some warning that mm -hmm. we can do something mm -hmm. different about it. 
Well, and in fact, you and I are involved with something that can really help people talk about that fear of death. Uh, there's an event that I've held a number of times called the Death Cafe, which actually comes to us from England, where people get together and they have tea and cakes and just talk about whatever's on their hearts and their heads mm -hmm. about death. Mm -hmm. And there's no agenda, just a good sharing of, of thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, people will definitely want to check at a goodgoodbye.com for whenever we have another death cafe coming Great. up. Great, yeah. And another way to help start the conversation is to check out the resources of Compassion and Choices. That's a great organization that has a number of resources at compassionandchoices.org to help you understand your choices when it comes to life and facing your own death, to uh, promote advocacy, in support of people's choices in their way of facing life and death. And uh, any other um, points you had mentioned you wanted they, to add They about actually that? have a very um, aggressive or thorough counseling program, program. where oh. if somebody gets a diagnosis or has a family member that has a diagnosis that appears to be prog progressive and life-threatening, mm -hmm. uh, they have people that are trained to help walk you through what are ways to approach that, how to approach your physician, what are the questions you want to begin to ask that person about how they would want to die. Oh, the, that is so important. So check out their website, CompassionAndChoices.org. They have lots of good information. Have you been with people when they've actually died? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What tips would you give to a family member or loved one who's with somebody who's dying? I, my tip would be to just be present in what's happening. Um, I, it has been one of the most beautiful natural processes I have been able to witness. And most family members, when they have seen the person that died afterwards, are so relieved because there is such a look of peace. Mm. If they've been struggling, which most of us struggle when we die because we don't want to leave the people we love, mm -hmm. there's such a release. Of, of that stress and fear, that it really is comforting to the family to, to witness that as well. Mm -hmm. Perhaps a setting, playing nice music that the dying person likes? Mm -hmm. If you know the music they like, it's mm -hmm. nice to play music in the background. It's nice to say what's in your heart that you want to make sure you feel comfortable, you've said. Mm -hmm. the, the end result is we as the living need to make decisions that we know we can live with for the rest of our life. Mm. So if you have not had a chance to say certain things that are in your heart, whether they're awake or not, mm -hmm. I know for a fact they can still hear us because <laughs> I've had a personal experience where that happened. Really? It was remarkable. <laughs> so I, I absolutely tell people, say what's in your heart and make sure you leave nothing unsaid that's important mm -hmm. because it matters to you as the living mm -hmm. as much or more so than the person who's dying. What other things can people do with um, hospice care? Um, isn't that a Medicaid, Medicare? Medicaid. So hospice is... <laughs> Let's clarify <it's>, that. <laughs> so hospice is a medical benefit, is mm -hmm. how I say it. Mm -hmm. So you, you qualify on medical criteria. A doctor has to certify. Mm -hmm. The basic criteria they use is that you they will document that to the best of their ability, if we did nothing medically, they anticipate this diagnosis would take your life within six months. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you're gonna die in six months or less. There are people that stay on hospice longer, but they have to meet that criteria to certify. And some people graduate from hospice. Some people flunk they get, hospice, they, actually. They what? <laughs> well, graduating would be to die, so you flunk oh. hospice by living longer. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but, it's, so a medical benefit, it's covered uh, the most thoroughly under Medicare. In other words, there's, I don't think there's a copay for anybody on Medicare to mm -hmm. go on hospice. Most commercial plans now have a hospice benefit, but there are financial, uh, there's a financial part of that that the that patient would pay. be res responsible for. Uh -huh. And Medicaid does have a hospice benefit, but you have to look state to state how they, how how they it interpret it, yeah. Okay. And when um, you're on hospice, you have uh, the social worker who can work with the family mm -hmm. and um, help facilitate conversation, or is that up to the um, 
chaplain. So the, the, basically hospice is probably one of the few areas of medical care that truly plans for body, mind, and spirit mm -hmm. care. Mm -hmm. The body is the nurse and the doctor and the medicines and the physical comfort. Um, the psychological can be the social worker and sometimes the chaplain, but the spiritual is, is usually the chaplain or their spiritual community support. And they all are included, but, but the patient decides what services they want to bring in. The only thing that's required okay. they see is the nurse okay, and probably the doctor. Mm -hmm. But all the other services are optional at their request. Now, isn't it something like people go on hospice on average, what, 10 days before they die? Yeah, I think, I think the do, average length of stay is seven days. Seven something, days. Something like that. Yeah. Why do people wait so long before taking advantage of this great service? I, again, I think it's a combination of things, both the doctors not really being sure or comfortable having the conversations. I think it's our natural fear of dying. And it could be that gray area of when do we stop aggressive treatment and really work on quality of life. And we have been trained as a culture really to work on aggressive care mm -hmm. for a maximum amount of time. Stay alive for as long as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you know, when, when you do recognize, okay, we're getting close to the end, mm -hmm. I think perhaps it gives the family permission to let down some of those barriers, although I guess people react differently to it. I think you made a good point in your intro when you said talking about death or acknowledging you're going to die doesn't make you dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's still part of the conversation when you're getting to hospice care. I, I, fe I think sometimes patients may feel their doctors are abandoning them or somehow we're withholding something from them mm -hmm. by not offering them more aggressive treatment mm -hmm. when what we're really doing is try to act, let them access the best quality of life care. That is so important. I, um, within my own family, I've seen parents wanting, you know, to do very aggressive things in the hope of, you know, I want to see my granddaughter get married right. and dance at her wedding and right. things like that. Right. Um, but you never know how those kind of things are going to turn out. And, and the interesting thing I've noticed from my years of experience is many times when people choose the quality of life and comfort care, it extends their life to a certain degree because there are huge risks physically to doing aggressive care when your body is already fighting a disease or an aging process. Mm -hmm. And I have seen people live th beyond what the doctors would have put, estimated mm -hmm. because they've gone on hospice and really there's, there's a relief of stopping the fight mm -hmm. and using that energy to keep, to start the living again. To, to focus on getting the most out of every day. Right, right. Yeah. Um, any other last tips you would like to suggest people think about? I. I would encourage people to really face their fears and have the conversation. And the easiest thing to do would be to start it on yourself. Mm. Go to the Conversation Project website. It's just theconversationproject.org. Download the questions, answer them for yourself, and you be the example that hopefully others will lead or follow. Mm -hmm. You be the leader, they will follow and begin the conversation for yourself and then within your family. Mm -hmm. uh, as you progress in that or as you have aging parents, reach out to the, a lot more community resources are available now to help you begin to sort out, how do I talk to my doctor about this? How do I make mm -hmm. sure that the people that are gonna be in the medical system taking care of me understand this is what I want and mm -hmm. I've made this decision for mm -hmm. myself? That's absolutely uh, such a good point. I do talk about leading by example. Lead by. When uh, I was researching a good goodbye, my husband and I went to the local cemetery to buy burial plots for ourselves, and we invited his parents to come along. And they were like, you're going plot shopping? Sure, we'll come. And we had a nice outing. They saw, we bought, we've got plots together. We're set. Mm -hmm. So yeah, lead by example, start that conversation. Mm -hmm. So uh, our special thanks today to Mindy Horwich, licensed independent social worker for being with us today. And a big thank you to the French family of companies for supporting this program. 
Join us next week as we look at grief counseling issues. And remember, you can find out more about today's topic and a whole lot of other great information at my website, agoodgoodbye.com. Remember, talking about sex won't make you pregnant. Talking about funerals won't make you dead. Start a conversation today. Proper estate planning enables you to pass your possessions and your assets to the people and organizations that you care about. By planning with a living trust, you could avoid the high cost of probate and minimize taxation. The attorneys at Morris Hall have been helping thousands of clients pass their assets as they intended. To schedule your free consultation, call us at 505-889-0100 or visit us at morristrust.com. A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die is a light touch on a serious subject. The book has everything you need to know before you go. A Good Goodbye helps you reduce stress and family conflict, save money, and create a meaningful, memorable good goodbye. It's available in paperback and all ebook formats through online retailers and at agoodgoodbye.com. Start a conversation today. Why are we talking about this at the dinner table? Just put my ashes in a coffee can or something. Please pass the salt, dear. Can I help you, ma'am? Yeah. Which can would you recommend putting my mom's ashes in? Uh, I think I heard ashes. I'm sorry, my mom's cremated remains. <laughs> that sounds the same. Your mom didn't even like coffee. She drank tea. You can't avoid your funeral. Pre-plan and take the burden off someone else. Hi, I'm Gail Rubin, host and author of A Good Goodbye, Funeral Planning for Those Who Don't Plan to Die, and creator of The Newly Dead Game. The Newly Dead Game is like the classic TV show, The Newly Wed Game, but the questions test how well you know someone else's last wishes. It's a fun way to get the funeral planning conversation started. For more information about The Newly Dead Game, visit agoodgoodbye.com.